before it happened, most of us thought about fossil fuels only when we filled up our cars. Then the whole extraction industry collapsed, and we realized that something more important than transportation was completely dependent on these fuels. And that was the food system. We never thought about the fact that from growing and harvesting to processing and transportation, our food was made using fossil fuels. This is the story of a family trying to cope with the loss of those fuels. We have to grow, harvest, and forage for ourselves in a new world. It's called Food Mageddon. Get so close. Push, push. Come on. Come on, Chicky. Yeah. <laughs> what a black one. That's how it was last time. Remember, it was all black ones in the beginning. <gasps> Yay! We're gonna breathe in oh, hard. That was so much work, huh? Yay! You got a friend now. Hi and welcome. It's the beginning of April, and we're really enjoying spring. Uh, as you saw, we have chickens hatching, so that's really exciting. Uh, we are also working on the fence line. This time we're working on the fence on our property. We're planting out field peas, uh, so we have to prepare those fields. I'll walk you through that. Uh, we're trying to make cheese, and that's a bit of an experiment. Um, and we have a couple other uh, projects going on around here, so uh, it should be a busy week. It's now the end of the first day of hatching, and we have four chicks, three black, one yellow, and the three black ones hatched early this morning, so they're ready to come out of the incubator. The yellow one just hatched, so he or she is going to stay for the rest of the night there. We have a couple more eggs that have pipped, but haven't hatched yet, so their lungs are adjusting to air and all that, so they may or may not come on out the next 24 hours, and hopefully the rest of these will also pip and start coming out. So let's see as we move these black ones to their new habitat. So yeah, we're really excited about the chickens coming out. Uh, our hatch rate wasn't as good as we would have liked. Uh, we started out with 34 eggs, but we only got eight chickens, which is actually pretty poor. Uh, usually you can expect around 50% hatch rate. I think what the underlying thing was, I kept them out too long before putting them in the incubator after they were laid by the hens. That's probably where I, I ran into trouble. So of course my big goal this year was to have the chickens hatch their own eggs and the reason was it would save me all this trouble. I wouldn't have had to three times a day rotate all the eggs and make sure that everything is the right temperature and humidity and all that. I wouldn't have had to do that. And now I have another six weeks of babysitting these chicks to do that the mother isn't doing because none of the heads went broody. So what I have here is a box with a heat lamp and the heat lamp heats the, the space under it to about 100 degrees. 95, 90, 95 to 100 degrees. And the box is big enough that if they get warm, they can run away from the lamp, and if they get cold, they can go under the lamp. Um, and this is gonna be their home for the next five, six weeks, so uh, maybe I'll move them out to the garage if I can. Um, but also, you know, super dangerous fire hazard in the house, a cardboard box with a heat source in it, not a great thing. I have a smoke detector right here. Um, but again, not ideal. Really wish the hens would win broody. Maybe next year. So as I bring each one into the new enclosure, I have to dip its beak in water because otherwise it won't know to drink there. I mean, how would they know? They don't have a mother to show them where to drink. And another thing you notice, there's no food in here. And that's because if I give them food, they might eat a whole bunch of food. And then they get what's called pasting up where all that food without water rehydrates in their intestines and then they get an obstructed bowel and so we have to give them water for about 24 hours and then after they have water flowing through their system then we can feed them so as long as one of them remembers where that water is and what it's for the rest of them will see them drinking i also have some roosts in here they might not use the <laughs> one of them is under the roost okay um they might not use the roost right now but if you don't have a roost 
in this area, they never learn to sleep on a roost and then they'll sleep on the ground in the coop and that's a mess and a problem, especially in the winter. So you gotta have roosting areas in there for them to learn how to use. And now they get to hang out in here. The best part is they run around, especially when there's more of them, they're all flock together, run around, and um, and then they'll all fall down and sleep together. It's pretty cute. Why are you scuttling on the ground? Do you have leg problems? All right, yellow beak might have leg problems, so we have to watch to make sure that she or he stands up fully. I'm also spending as much time as I can outside, uh, still working on perimeter fences. This time I'm working on our property uh, to get our permanent fencing in, uh, which is taking up a lot of time, but it's again really important. Every night when I go out to the chicken coop, I'm scaring away four or five rabbits out of our garden area. So it's important that we get them out now. Uh, otherwise they'll eat all of our starts. And now I'm on my fence line around our property. What I have here are some lines that need to be tightened up a fence to keep out deer, and then a lower fence to keep out rabbits. Obviously not installed well. This is loose, I need to dig it in. Uh, this is all loose, I, I kind of threw it up last year. But I need to get this in place and tight to keep the rabbits out of our grow beds. Accepted wisdom is that you're supposed to dig down a foot and then put down your barrier and cover it back up to keep the rabbits out. Well, something I found online that I found has been working for me, your experience may vary, is to dig down six inches and then bend it out. The idea being, rabbits and other burrowing animals are cute. I don't want them in my garden, but also not the sharpest tools in the animal shed. And so what happens is, this being buried like that, they come to the edge of the fence covered in dirt and they start digging and they find this and they start to dig down, down, down and all they hit is this and they don't think or can't dig all the way under and then back underneath to get under it. Uh, it's just not in their mental repertoire to dig around it. They only dig through or under things. They can't dig back and around. And so this seems to keep the diggers out or it has in the places where I've installed it. So I push this down about six inches and then I bend it out. And I do that along the whole fence line and it seems to work. One change I did have to make though was I had to make this a little higher. Rabbits can jump higher than I thought so I have to have at least two feet off the ground or they get over. We're also working on getting beds together and that's an ongoing process because we let the chickens into the garden area on the off season and they really tear it up. But they also deposit a lot of nitrogen. This whole area has been picked over by the chickens, but it's actually eight different uh, garden beds. I've got to whip them into shape so that I can get planting in them pretty soon. So this mound here is a continuation of the mound that I'm Leveling. Basically this was pushed over by a bulldozer at some time in the past and now I have to human bulldozer it out. But luckily, luckily it's all topsoil. So I can just dig it out and put it right in my bed. It's, you know, kind of a gift, but also a lot of work. I also spent a good chunk of time this week planting peas. And we're talking field peas. Uh, out in the back 40, uh, so I had to do uh, quite a lot of work to prepare the field and get the plants in. So I'm here for the day, and the plan is is to plant this whole area with field peas. And I grew peas over here last year, but this year, this is my pea plot. And right now, as you can see, it's covered with vegetation. It's just kind of hummocky. I've got to clear it all out, dig it all up, and then get the peas in the ground. Okay, so here's what we have. Right here, that I'm walking on is a pathway. And this is gonna be open all season. And then I have a foot of grow bed. And I'm gonna be doing a hybrid pea growing method uh, that I just kind of made up. 
usual field peas, what you do is you plow the whole area up, you sprinkle the peas across, and then you run your goats over it, or you run a uh, harrow over it to turn them into the top inch or two of soil. That's like the old way of doing it in the Middle Ages. Today, obviously, um, tractors with cedars come by and they it's a different high-tech thing. Um, but in the garden, usually what you do is you grow a strip of them and then you give them rope uh, or a trellis to crawl up and to trellis themselves up on. Um, and that's when you're going for a lot more work and a lot more yield of uh, snap peas and other uh, green peas, but I'm going for seeds because I want seeds to eat this winter. I want uh, split pea soup and the like. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do these strips kind of like in a garden and I'm going to run a uh, string across for them to crawl up, to trellis up, uh, but I'm doing it in the field situation so I'm not going to be as assiduous as I would be in the garden. You'll see that on other videos. But so what I'm going to do is make one foot strips all the way across what this field is going to be and then I'm going to leave all this mulch that I'm raking up in the space between the pathways and that will hopefully uh, keep the weeds down there. Uh, once the seedlings have emerged and are tall enough, I will rake this mulch, rotted mulch, onto the bottom to help uh, keep the weeds down there and then I will hoe and keep the space between them open. Uh, so basically I'm using a line as a, as a straight edge and I'm making stripes across this whole area. As you can see, I have stripes now every, every two feet. They're a wall one foot wide. In between, I've got all this compost. And this will break down. It'll smother weeds, hopefully. And then after about a month, when the seedlings have emerged, I'll start coming through and I'll hoe this all down, push it to the sides to smother weeds on the peas themselves. So this has been my morning's work so far, and uh, now to plant the peas. This is a pretty awesome cedar uh, donated to our tool library by Mark. Well, the Technology Institute has a tool library, meaning our neighbors can come and borrow this anytime they want. Um, for free. And what it does is it has a wheel, the front wheel drives a belt, that belt rotates a little cupped disc. And that disc picks up a set number of seeds each revolution, dropping about eight seeds per foot on each pass. So if I pass by twice, I have approximately the seeding rate I want, which is 16 seeds per foot length, per foot wide. So it's about 16 seeds per square foot. So what I'm setting up today are the trellises for the peas. These will be the end posts, those will be stakes, and I'm gonna run line like this for the peas to trellis up. But today, I'm putting netting over it because I don't want the birds to eat all the peas. When the pea shoots sprout, they're delectable uh, little treats for birds. I had to actually scare some birds off of here when I was coming in today. And uh, they're full of protein, they're tender, they're delicious. So they'd be favorite food of birds, so I'm going to cover it with netting and hope that that keeps the birds off. I'm also taking my first crack at making cheese, and I am not a professional cheesemaker. I've never really made cheese before, except once I tried to do it with a friend uh, over New Year's, and it turned out, mm, well, it was a spreadable cheese type paste. It was good. Uh, but I'm actually trying to make cheddar cheese now, which requires a lot more work. So uh, we'll see how it goes. I'm not going to walk you through every step of the instructions because this is my first time doing it. So I'm really just here to show you uh, what I'm doing. And uh, if you want to learn how to do this, there's lots of great resources online and I'll link to them uh, here as I go along. Today I'm making cheese and cheese is great because it's a way that people before industrialization, well, even now, were able to save excess dairy. And a lot of this information, again, comes from Townsend's, which I linked to in the last video, and I will also link to in this video right there. Maybe it's there. I don't know. One of these two corners. And so what I have here is uh, two gallons of milk, plus a pint of buttermilk, 
And now I am adding uh, eighth teaspoon calcium chloride. Never mind my assistant over there who's banging pots and pans together. Um, I'll link to the instructions I used for this for, uh, from Cultures for Health. Uh, but right now, I'm just about to pitch the cultures that uh, cause the milk to ferment. And then we'll have uh, a whole step by step through the whole process. And hopefully by the end of the day, I'll have cheddar. And my goal is to find a local. My goal is to find someone with cows lo locally from whom I can buy milk and make cheese for the winter because we're not going to be able to buy cheese, transportation is not. So we're going to have to go back to making our own cheese. So this is. So this is just an experiment to see if I can do it. What I'm going to do now is mix in my mesotheliomic culture. This might be overkill because I already put in buttermilk, but... Again, if there's too much culture, it's not going to hurt anything. It's just going to fight the bad bacteria faster. So now, I have to wait one hour for this to ferment or to culture. So I'm going to put a lid on it and wrap it in a towel. Okay, it's been an hour. So now I've brought the temp back up to about 90 degrees. And I'm going to now fold in, after I stir and homogenize the milk, the culture. So now this is all cultured milk. A half a tablet, vegetable rennet, diluted in a half cup of water. And the rennet, traditionally, would come from the stomach lining of a baby calf because that causes the milk to coagulate in the stomach of the calf or here at the calf body temperature of 90 some degrees, right? So we're basically recreating the inside of a calf stomach. Cut the curd with a knife. the last stir and then it sits for 20 minutes the next task is cheddaring and I'm not very good at this so I have 100 degree water here, so it's a water bath. The curd sits in, and every 15 minutes I have to take it out and try and flip these curds as, as a unit. Oh, it's finally starting to stick together. Um, it hasn't been sticking together for me on previous turns. And this is what gives cheddar cheese its particular characteristics. I don't know the exact reason why, but this is the cheddaring process. I don't know the underlying chemistry or... got a little time to work on some random projects like making a net for uh, sucker fishing uh, and I also got to work on a cart uh, that's gonna help me move things around the garden a little better than my wheelbarrow. Sucker season is also coming up uh, and so I need to make a net to catch a whole bunch of these fish. So I got some mason's twine and now I'm gonna make a net. So I'm building a little cart 
to help me move things around. The wheelbarrow is great, but a cart has a different purpose. So let's get to work on that. Something fun from last fall that's starting to creep up. I've got little garlics poking through. Most of the way down. Garlic, 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 garlic. So hopefully this fall we're gonna have some big old good garlics. So I'll have to put some, keep some mulch and other weed protectors on here. But we have our garlic crop already cropping, already coming up. Thanks for tuning in to another week uh, here on Food Mageddon. We are uh, enjoying ourselves and spending a lot of time out in the garden, uh, but you know it's because of a kind of a bad reason. Uh, the collapse or the crisis that we're all suffering through isn't great for everybody. We totally understand that. We're really lucky in that we have the time, energy, and space to do what we're doing. So we are absolutely appreciative of that fact. And as always, don't forget to subscribe, uh, click the link below, and remember next time on the next episode, I'm cutting down the introduction, so if you've been skipping over the first minute, I don't blame you. I'm going to cut it down to about 10 seconds, so you can just let it play and you don't have to skip ahead. Uh, so don't forget that. We'll eventually be working on another podcast. You can also follow along on the blog. We have more information and different types of information. And yeah, thanks for watching. Take care and stay safe.